Right now on Morning News Now, historic hearing on Capitol Hill. Tempers flared as lawmakers blasted the CEOs of five major social media companies for what they say was rampant sexual exploitation and drug trafficking on their platforms. We are uh, here in this hearing um, because as a collective, your platforms really suck. You have an army of lawyers and lobbyists that have fought us on this every step of the way. We'll bring you the moment where Meta CEO Mark Zuckerberg apologized to families after being told he has blood on his hands and the big question about what happens next. Also this morning, the U.S. preparing to strike back after a drone attack killed three American soldiers in Jordan, who the U.S. now says was responsible and what retaliation could look like. A deadly collapse, at least three people were killed and nearly a dozen others hurt after a building under construction collapsed at the Boise, Idaho airport. What we've learned about the structure as investigators work to figure out what went wrong. And bad blood. Taylor Swift has become the target of conservative conspiracy theories that has some seeing red. Separately, we'll tell you why her record label is now pulling her music from TikTok as we separate fact from folklore. It's all sorts of interesting theories that are yes, being spread lots of, online. Lots Most of theories true. that we love a chance to make a little Taylor Swift pun. Good to have you with us this morning. I'm Joe Fryer. And I'm Savannah Sellers. Thanks for joining us. We're going to get started in Washington with the fallout from that Senate Judiciary Committee hearing on online child safety. Executives from five major social media companies testified and were grilled by lawmakers for hours. The hearing was aimed at addressing serious questions about how platforms are impacting children. Lawmakers accused the tech leaders of failing to protect young users from abuse. To help punctuate that point, the committee room was filled with families of victims of online exploitation. Executives faced tough questions, leading to some contentious back and forth moments. Here's a snippet from yesterday's hearing. Have you ever been a member of the Chinese Communist Party? Senator, I'm Singaporean. No. Have you ever been associated or affiliated with the Chinese Communist Party? No, Senator. Again, okay. I'm Singaporean. You have convinced over two billion people to give up all of their personal information, every bit of it, in exchange for getting to see what their high school friends had for dinner Saturday night. That's pretty much your business model, isn't it? It's not how I would characterize it. Your platform is basically an espionage arm for the Chinese Communist Party. Why should you not be banned in the United States of America? There are I, a lot that is slipping through. It appears that you're trying to be the premier sex trafficking no, site. Of course not, Senator. In this uh, country. Senator, that's ridiculous. No, uh, it Senator, is not ridiculous. Uh, uh, in a few moments, we are going to hear from someone who was in that room, a mother whose son died by suicide. We do want to begin with NBC News congressional correspondent Julie Serkin and NBC News youth and Internet culture reporter Kellen Rosenblatt. Julie, let's start with you. Just walk us through what else happened during the hearing. What were some of the key takeaways? Hey guys, well, this was a multi-hour hearing. You heard some of the emotion behind the with the parents behind the tech CEOs who were sitting there getting grilled by senators. This is an issue rare nowadays to have bipartisan agreement between Republicans and Democrats that big tech, in this case specifically when it comes to kids' safety online, needs to be railed in. There were some testy exchanges. There were remarks made by the CEOs of these companies. I should note about half of them uh, appeared before the committee on subpoena. They did not appear willingly. Take a listen to what they had to say. We also support setting industry standards on age appropriate content and limiting signals for advertising to teens to age and location and not behavior. At the end of the day, we want everyone who uses our services to have safe and positive experiences. As a mother, this is personal, and I share the sense of urgency. X is an entirely new company. You have my personal commitment that X will be active and a part of this solution. 
guys, X is actually one of those companies that the committee, the Judiciary Committee, had to subpoena in order to appear before this panel. There was also a moment that you referenced where Mark Zuckerberg, followed by a question by Senator Josh Hawley, a Republican, actually turned to the parents and apologized to them. Some of the parents afterwards told our Kate Snow that they didn't buy that apology. But still, this was a stunning moment with big tech CEOs on the Hill getting that bipartisan grilling. The question is, will any legislation actually come from it? Callan, let's bring you in here. As we mentioned, there were family members who attended the hearing, people, uh, families that had been impacted, uh, they say, by these negative experiences on social media. What's been some of their reaction to what they heard in that room yesterday? Well, Savannah, Joe, you did need to talk to the parents one on one to get a sense of what they thought. At one point, they were booing and hissing these tech CEOs. Uh, they were laughing at things that they said. And then these senators were getting a pause break, something that's super rare in these hearings. It was clear that the parents thought that the responses from the tech CEOs were a joke. They I believe they said that. Uh, and, and we have actually two parents who were in the room. Here's what they had to say about the tech hearing. He looked at me, he looked at my daughter's picture, and nothing. I feel, I don't feel like he has emotion in general. I thought that was a joke. <laughs> Honestly, you know, that was just one of those moments where he was caught red-handed. He's embarrassed, he's mortified, and he, now he needs to answer for everything that's happening. These tech CEOs were fighting uphill to make inroads with these parents. It's clear that yesterday they were unimpressed. Julie, you know, a big question now that remains following the hearing is whether any legislation will actually make it through Congress, will actually pass. We see this unanimous bipartisan support there in that hearing. So what's going on? What are some of the obstacles in the way? Look, Congress has long not been able to tackle big tech. They have not been able to regulate, really, the Internet in the 28 years that it's been around. That's a point that Senator Amy Klobuchar made relentlessly in the room. But still, there are at least five pieces of legislation swirling around, a lot of it with a lot of bipartisan support. And this isn't legislation that was written up yesterday. Some of these bills have been around for years. This isn't the first time we're seeing these big tech CEOs grilled by Congress either. But something Klobuchar and other senators pointed to is the massive lobbying powers that these companies have. Some of the legislation that we're seeing includes Section 232 reform that will enable parents and really anybody uh, who wants to sue these companies in civil court to do so right now. They're not able to. That's something Senator Lindsey Graham, who's the top Republican on the judiciary panel, said he wants to try and pass by unanimous consent. That means no floor vote. He wants that to happen. But before the fall, he said there's something else known as the Kids Online Safety Act from Senators Blackburn and Blumenthal, which would give parents more control over what their children have access to online. Again, all of these bills, they might have unanimous support, but the question is, will they get the floor time? Will they get the support and effort from Congress to pass it? Majority Leader Schumer told NBC News it's a top priority for him. Callan, these CEOs were asked directly many times, would you support this piece of legislation? Would you support this piece of legislation? For the most part, they kind of dodged answering directly or just said not at this point. But we did hear them touting things that they have done or money that they have committed in these spaces. What have these platforms tried to do in recent years to address abuse on their platforms? Well, platforms have a lot of controls for parents. They specifically put in... Uh oversight for parents to see what their children are messaging, what they're looking at. They put in time restrictions. There are many, many tools that parents can use to watch what their children are doing. And there are many tools that try to either nudge teens away from dangerous content or even tell them you know, to take a break from these apps. The issue is that the, the internet and social media are still the Wild West. As Julie mentioned, they're still super underregulated. And I think parents are really looking for more oversight from Washington, D.C. so they can relax a little when their kids are on these platforms, knowing that someone else is holding these tech CEOs accountable. All right, Julie and Callan, thank you both for kicking us off this hour. We appreciate it. And right now we are actually joined by one of those parents. Sharon Winkler is with us. Her son Alex died by suicide at the age of 17 and she was at the hearing yesterday. Sharon, good morning. Thank you very much for joining us. And we want to start by saying we are sorry for your loss. As I just mentioned, your son Alex died by suicide back in 2017. And we understand this was after being bullied by anonymous users online. And first, I'm just wondering your thoughts on the hearing yesterday, what you heard in the room, and if you think any progress was made. Well, I, I 
clearly, I was very disappointed. None of the CEOs convinced me that youth online safety was a, a key priority for them. It was especially disappointing to hear Mark Zuckerberg maintain that no one could prove that his uh, platforms caused youth harms. Most of the centers presented very thorough and convincing arguments that these platforms do not cause youth harms, do cause youth harms. However, I agree with Senator Graham that we've had enough hearings and it's time for Congress to take some action and pass COSA now. We want to thank you for sharing that beautiful picture of your mm -hmm. son, Alex, behind you there. I want to ask you a little more about one of the things that made so many <clears throat> headlines. Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg apologizing directly to you. We're going to show that moment real quickly here. I'm sorry for everything that you have all gone through. It's terrible. No one should have to go through the things that your families have, have suffered. And this is why we invest so much and are going to continue doing industry-leading efforts. To, uh, to make sure that no one has to go through the types of things that your families have had to suffer. We just heard some parents say they didn't buy it, they thought it was a joke. How did you feel in that moment? Did you think it was genuine? Well, it, it was good to be seen and acknowledged, uh, especially after Meta's platform so often refused to take any action against uh, users who uh, post harmful content or to even take that content down. I thank Senator Hawley for pushing for the apology, but I doubt that it's gonna make any changes at Meta. Sharon, for people who maybe don't have children or aren't exposed to these platforms or in trying to keep their kids safe from something and who might think, you know, bullying also happens in school or, or texting can be a, a form of communication that could essentially be harmful. How would legislation specifically around social media, something like the Kids Online Safety Act, make a material difference? How do you think it would save lives? There, there are many ways that uh, the COSA will uh, save lives. First of all is the duty of care. It makes companies accountable for preventing and mitigating specific harms, such as suicide, eating disorders, cyberbullying, substance abuse, and sexual exploitation. It makes uh, has safeguards for minors, such as the safest settings by default, the ability to easily opt out of algorithms, mandates emergency reporting systems that address urgent concerns such as cyberbullying in an expedited time frame. It also calls for transparency, requiring that uh, platforms make publicly available independent third-party risk assessments and mandates that qualified researchers have access to platform data. COSA does not censor content. It regulates technologies by requiring that platforms are designed with youth safety as the highest priority. Sharon, we just want to give you a moment to tell us a little more about your son, Alex, and how do you hope to honor his memory? You know, Alex was a, a, a terrific kid. He was uh, so fun and so sensitive. Uh, he cared for other people so much. And, um, I'd like to think that uh, he's he's here with me, uh, hoping that we can prevent this tragedy from happening to other families. Mm -hmm. Sharon Winkler, we appreciate your time. Thank you so much for sharing your experience in that room as well as telling us about your son. We really appreciate it. Thank you. And if you or anyone you know is struggling, you can call or text the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline right there on your screen, 988. Let's turn now to some other news in the Middle East and the ongoing fallout from Sunday's drone attack in Jordan that killed three U.S. soldiers and injured dozens more. U.S. officials say they're still weighing a response, but say the retaliatory campaign could take weeks. It comes as the White House attributed the attack to a group called Islamic Resistance in Iraq. Joining us now, NBC News White House correspondent Ali Rafa and Jonathan Lord, a senior fellow and director of the Middle East Security Program at the Center for a New American Security and former Department of defense analyst. Good morning to both of you. Thanks for joining us, Allie. Let's start with you. So tell us a little more about who the U.S. is blaming for this drone attack. We understand one of the groups, which is part of the Islamic resistance umbrella, is the one that recently announced it was suspending attacks on U.S. forces. Is that right? 
Yeah, that's right, Joe. And the Pentagon says in reaction to that vow that actions speak louder than words. And as far as how the attribution uh, for this attack that killed three U.S. service members and injured dozens of others has evolved. Remember, earlier this week, we saw the president issue a statement where he attributed this attack directly to Iranian-backed militias, but said that the U.S. intelligence community was still gathering more facts. Then yesterday, we saw White House officials come out and directly pin the on the Islamic resistance group in Iraq. Listen to how National Security Council spokesperson uh, Admiral John Kirby talked about this yesterday in the White House press briefing. We believe that the, uh, uh, the attack in Jordan was, uh, was uh, planned, resourced, and facilitated by an umbrella group called the Islamic resistance in Iraq, uh, which contains uh, multiple groups, including Kitab Hezbollah. You, you can't take what a group like Kitab Hezbollah says at face value. They're not the, the sole proprietors here uh, of the violence that have been has been visited on our on our people. And for context, remember, Iran has denied responsibility for this attack. And while the U.S. can't directly uh, pin the blame on Iran for this, the intelligence community has clearly said that this attack appears to have uh, Iran's fingerprints on it, with Iran providing financial and military support to uh, these militias. The president directly blaming Iran uh, for providing that support to those groups earlier this week, guys. Ali, do we have any more clues at this point about what retaliation could look like? Yes. Well, we did hear the president say earlier this week that he has decided uh, on a response after being presented with an array of options by his national security team. And officials are being careful not to signal any specifics, but we are getting some expectations on uh, what we could see next. They're saying that this is going to be a multi-phased approach that could uh, last several weeks. It won't just be a day as far as targets. Uh, this could include cyber operations in an effort to disrupt the communication and coordination of this group. It could include uh, a financial aspect as well in the form uh, of sanctions. And obviously there's that military component uh, where we know that GOP lawmakers have been pressuring the president to strike directly inside Iran. U.S. officials continuing to stress they do, that they do not seek a conflict uh, with Iran, but obviously because of the escalation with U.S. service members uh, being killed, we do expect uh, targets to be uh, targets to be targeted outside of Iran, possibly uh, Jordan, where these troops were killed, and uh, Syria and Iraq, where we know that U.S. service members have also been targeted, and where uh, these militia groups also have weapons storehouses, you guys. Jonathan, let's bring in you bring you in here and tap some of your expertise. What more can you tell us about the group involved, and how concerned should we be that whatever shape this retaliatory campaign takes, that it will drag the U.S. into potentially a prolonged war? Uh, but both good questions. We'll start with the first one. That's a little bit easier. Uh, Kataib Hezbollah is really the premier uh, Iran-backed militant force within Iraq. It is of um, the the groups uh, the most capable, the most highly trained. Uh, most of these groups uh, were dormant after the U.S. Uh, left Iraq um, in 2011 and really came back uh, in a big way uh, when ISIS was expanding. Um, they have stuck around. They have uh, received immense amounts of support from Iran, both financial and military, uh, to include the weapons that uh, Kataib Hezbollah is now firing on uh, U.S. forces. We've seen over 150 of these attacks uh, since the beginning of the conflict in Gaza. Um, so uh, that's uh, likely to continue in some form or fashion. Um, as for escalation, you know, the administration has been very overt in its goal to avoid escalation. They have been messaging that. Um, that is responsible. Uh, in some ways, however, uh, it might actually be counterproductive in the sense that it's given Tehran, uh, the capital of Iran, uh, a freer hand uh, to slowly escalate uh, in all regions of the Middle East, knowing that the U.S. is going to self-censor and restrain its own action. Uh, ultimately, we'll have to see. With that in mind, Jonathan, what you've just laid out, this connection, of course, to the conflict we're seeing in Israel and Gaza, is the U.S. doing enough, both publicly and privately, to bring this conflict to an end? 
Um, yeah, I think there's there, there's a wide agreement uh, that the conflict needs to end. But realistically speaking, um, it doesn't appear that the Israelis can end this conflict uh, absent reaching uh, the two main goals. Uh, goal number one, uh, return of the remaining hostages, of which there are 136, uh, half a dozen of whom are actually Americans. Uh, and the other goal uh, is the destruction of Hamas's military and political capabilities. Uh, so unless uh, Israel can at least achieve uh, one of those, uh, really both of those, uh, it's very hard, I think, for Israel, Israel's political and military leaders uh, to return to a population which is highly shocked and traumatized from the terrorist events of October 7th uh, and say that they have accomplished their goals and defended the state of Israel and been able to protect uh, the Israeli population in the future. All right, Ali, Rafa, and Jonathan Lord, thank you both. Appreciate it. Well, at least three people are dead and nine others were injured after a hangar that was under construction at the Boise, Idaho airport collapsed. It happened Wednesday evening while crews were working on the steel frame of the building. Officials say a crane was placing something onto that structure when it collapsed. First responders described the scene as chaotic, saying it was difficult to reach the injured people and hoists had to be used to move the heavy steel beams. Investigators are now trying to determine what caused the frame to collapse. More rain, snow, and wind continue to pound the west. For more, let's get a check on your morning news now weather. We've got Michelle Grossman in studio with us this morning. Hey, Michelle, good morning. Hey there, guys. Good morning. Yeah, the atmospheric river does continue. We're looking at heavy rain falling in the state of California once again. The axis of the heavy rain will shift to the uh, southern parts of California, but still seeing some heavy rain in San Francisco this morning, Fresno, Los Angeles. You're looking at heavy rain. That's where we're seeing those darker colors. And we're also looking at heavy snow, too. We could see three to four feet of snow in the Sierra Nevada Mountains. As we go throughout today into tomorrow, a little break on Saturday and then Sunday, more powerful storm moves in Sunday into Monday. Millions under alerts. We're looking at 1 million under winter alerts, 25 million under wind alerts. That's going to bring down some power lines and cause some power outages. 22 million under flood alerts, where you see the green there. And we are looking at the chance for flash flooding because the ground is so soggy from a storm we had a week ago. So this is a setup area of low pressure, bringing that rain, that stream of moisture off the Pacific. So soaking rain for Southern California. California, rain and snow pushing into the Great Basin, into the Rockies. That's going to continue as we go throughout tomorrow. And then also looking at the chance for strong to severe storms in portions of the southern plains, especially where you see those dark colors. Even saw a little purple uh, on our future cast, and that could indicate that we could see some hail falling uh, tomorrow. Saturday, we're going to see the rain and storms advancing into the Mississippi Valley. Snow and wind continuing to blast the Rockies. And then we get a little break before that storm moves in Sunday into Monday. This is the second storm. Atmospheric River continues another one. This is going to be stronger than what we're seeing now, and this is a pretty strong one. Rain, wind, and snow hitting California once again. That's going to lead to the chance for some flash flooding. Also, high winds are going to lead to the chance of more power outages on Sunday into Monday. This is for today, a flash flood risk. We're looking at rainfall rates at three quarters of an inch per hour on top of that really soggy ground. Could see one to three inches of rain. And then in the snow, the highest elevations of the mountains could see three to four feet. Most of the peak will see two feet of snow. So a lot of snow in the mountains there. Otherwise, we're looking at really warm weather in portions of the middle of the country into the southern plains. Some spots in the southern plains could be in the 70s and breaking records there. Back to you guys. All right, Michelle, thank you so much. As tax season gets underway, the House of Representatives has approved a $78 billion tax package that could give many families a boost. It would expand the child tax credit and cut taxes for millions of low-income families. It was an overwhelming display of bipartisanship. The House voted 357 to 70 to pass the bill. That child tax credit expansion could help an estimated 16 million children in low-income families in just the first year alone. The bill also includes tax breaks for businesses, but it does face a more difficult path in the Senate where a vote is not yet scheduled. Let's stay on your wallet and get to that news out of the Fed yesterday. They kept interest rates unchanged as expected. But with inflation still above the Fed's 2% target, Chair Jerome Powell appeared to dash hopes of a March rate cut, and that surprised many market watchers who were predicting a cut at the next meeting. The question really is, that six months of good inflation data, is it sending us a true signal that we are, in fact, on uh, a path, a uh, sustainable path, down to 2% inflation? That's the question. We need to see more evidence that sort of confirms what we think we're seeing and that tells us that we are on, gives us confidence that we're on, uh, on a path to, a sustainable path down to 2% inflation. 
We've got our friend Investopedia editor-in-chief Caleb Silver here with us, of course. Caleb, good to see you. I know you have a countdown clock for the next one already. Yeah, that's already going. 48 days, 6 hours, and 36 minutes, but I'm not counting. There you go. All right. I'm doing the counting. So that's, it does seem far away. Okay, so that's when we're going to hear potentially about the, this March rate cut, but it seems like that's not happening. Were you surprised by that? And tell us a little bit more about what we heard from him. Yeah, basically what he said is he's done, he doesn't think the committee, the Federal Open Market Committee that makes the decision on interest rates, will reach a level of confidence by that meeting to cut rates. They've alluded to the fact they will cut rates this year probably three times probably three, uh, set three quarters of a percent. But hold your horses is basically what he's saying. They want to see inflation sticking around the 2% range. We did get the personal consumption expenditures index. That's the Fed's preferred gauge of inflation last Friday. 2% on a three and six month basis, but they want to see it throughout the year. They don't want to be surprised by inflation perking back up again. So if it's not March, when could it be? And in the interim, just for everyday Americans, what's the impact they're seeing right now by not seeing? Yeah, probably at the May meeting. What does it mean when the Fed raises interest rates or keeps them up here between five and a quarter and five and a half percent? It drives up mortgage rates. It drives up credit card APRs. It drives up new and used car loans. Anytime we borrow money, it's based off the Fed's prime rate. And the Fed's keeping that rate right here until prices, inflation in general, stays around the 2% zone. If you look at CPI, Consumer Price Index, that's the broader measure of goods, that's still around 3%. So we'll get another couple of inflation reports, a jobs report tomorrow for January. All that is data the Fed's going to use to decide whether or not they'll cut in March or May. But it feels like it's a May thing now. What are you going to be looking for in that jobs report? Well, we want to see if hiring is continuing to remain robust across sectors that pay well, but also wage increases have been a big deal over the last year and a half. They're up about 4%. If wages keep increasing, that's a little hot for the Fed. They want to see wages cool and hiring mellow to about 150,000 jobs a month. If we see that, it shows that we're kind of on the normalization track. That's what the Fed wants. Normal, yay. Yeah, what is that? Boring, mean? a boring <laughs> normal economy that grows a little bit. That's what we want. Caleb Silver, thank you as always. Coming up, a warning from the FBI director about Chinese hackers. Yeah, and why he says they're preparing to wreak havoc on the U.S. and where they could strike. But first, as senators push to reach a deal at the border, we're hearing from migrants caught in the middle of this political battle. That is next. We're back now with a look at the crisis at the southern border, which continues making headlines on Capitol Hill. House Republicans are moving closer to possibly impeaching the Secretary of Homeland Security, Alejandro Mayorkas. They're accusing him of failing to limit the flow of migrants at the southern border. NBC News correspondent David Noriega joins us from Eagle Pass, Texas, a border town that's really been at the center of this political battle as of late. David, good morning. Good morning, Joe. Yeah, I've been in Eagle Pass for a few days now. It's really remarkable how much this one small city on the border has become the main stage in this national political drama. First last month, uh, the city saw record numbers of migrants crossing the river here behind me. And even though those numbers are now way down, the tensions here are still quite high as they are in D.C. The border crisis landing at the doorstep of the White House as pressure mounts on President Biden. The ayes have it, and the motion is agreed to. Shortly after 1 a.m., House Republicans moving forward articles of impeachment against Department of Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas, which, if successful, would make him the first cabinet member to be impeached in nearly 150 years. Serious harm has occurred. Republicans accusing the secretary of willfully ignoring the law which they say has led to millions of migrant crossings. President Biden and Secretary Mayorkas have designed this catastrophe. Mayorkas calling the accusations baseless. Meanwhile, a new immigration bill mired in uncertainty. A bipartisan bill would be good for America and help fix our broken immigration system. The president saying he was ready to, quote, shut down the border if Congress allowed him. If that bill were the law today, I'd shut down the border right now and fix it quickly. Two sources familiar with the negotiations saying the proposed bill would force border authorities to turn away all migrants, even if they're seeking asylum, if the daily average of migrant encounters at the border hits 5,000 over a seven-day period, or if it hits 8,500 in a single day. And if a shutdown were to occur, 1,400 migrants would still be allowed to enter with an appointment through a port of entry per day. This is the only migrant shelter in Eagle Pass. Last month, more than 18,000 people came through this shelter. This room was completely packed. Right now, as you can see, it's almost empty. Some people say that this is an invasion, the number of people coming across the border. What do you think of that? 
it's not an invasion. Um, these people have a motive to leave their, their countries, and it's very sad to listen their stories. We spoke to a mother from Colombia, one of the few migrants at the shelter. She didn't want to show her face over concerns for their safety. She says there are a lot of people coming, but instead of shutting down the border, they should try to understand what's pushing them to migrate in the first place. The small border town of Eagle Pass has become a stage for political theater. The Texas National Guard has shut down parts of the border in a standoff with the federal government, and locals are now bracing themselves for the possible arrival of a convoy of Trump supporters that's set to arrive in town in just a few days. Some of those Trump supporters already trickling in, in some cases driving to the border from hours away. I think there's people that need to come in, but everything's not being done right. They're just letting everybody in, and, and I don't think it's good for our country. Now some locals in Eagle Pass saying they're tired of being caught in the middle of a political turf war. Joe, I spoke to one local official who was not able to speak to me on camera about uh, the extent to which local city officials are bracing themselves for the possible arrival of this convoy. Now, we don't know how big the convoy is going to be. There are some early indications that it's not nearly as big as organizers say that it is. But that's just one example of the way this city and the people who live here feel like they've been thrust into a political battle that they did not ask to be a part of. Joe. All right. David Noriega. David, thank you so much. Now let's get to a new warning from the FBI over the threat of hacking by China. As NBC News justice and intelligence correspondent Ken Delanian explains, FBI Director Christopher Wray says China is preparing to, quote, wreak havoc on American infrastructure in the event of war. FBI Director Christopher Wray told lawmakers Wednesday that China is hacking civilian networks in the United States so that it can cause destruction and panic in the event of a conflict. Officials say the U.S. needs to step up cybersecurity. The FBI director sounding the alarm about Chinese efforts to attack American power grids, transportation systems, and communications networks. China's hackers are positioning on American infrastructure in preparation to wreak havoc and cause real-world harm to American citizens and communities. And Christopher Wray announcing a major takedown of a Chinese hacking operation on American soil, dubbed Volt Typhoon. Working with our partners, the FBI ran a court-authorized on-network operation to shut down Volt Typhoon and the access it enabled. Steps China was taking, in other words, to find and prepare to destroy or degrade the civilian critical infrastructure that keeps us safe and prosperous. Ray and other officials say China poses the world's greatest cyber threat, and they warn that Americans remain vulnerable. U.S. Cybersecurity Chief Jen Easterly describing the devastating impact of a potential massive Chinese cyber attack. Telecommunications going down so people can't use their cell phone. People start getting sick from polluted water. Trains get derailed. Air traffic control system, port control systems are malfunctioning. This is truly an everything, everywhere, all at once scenario. Easterly said China believes that sort of cyber attack would crush any American will to defend Taiwan from a Chinese invasion. In a statement to NBC News, a Chinese government spokesman denied China hacks into foreign networks, calling it irresponsible criticism. One thing that didn't come up at the hearing was America's own offensive cyber capabilities, which are substantial and rarely discussed. But U.S. officials say they would follow international law in the event of a cyber war and not target civilian networks not linked to the military. Back to you. All right, Ken Delanian, strong reporting. Thank you very much. Let's check on international headlines. This morning, protesters are demanding more from Haiti's government as gang violence worsens on the island nation. NBC News foreign correspondent Claudio Lavanga has that details on that as well as other world news. Hey, Claudio, good morning. Savannah and Joe, good morning. Well, that's right. It definitely looks like that the ongoing crime wave in Haiti has reached boiling point and protesters burned this barricade in the capital, Port-au-Prince. The people are pushing back against the government led by Prime Minister Ariel Henry, demanding that more should be done to fix the rising rate of gang violence that continue to displace residents in droves. In fact, according to UNICEF, over 300,000 people have become internally displaced and kidnappings have nearly doubled since 2022. These heavily armed gangs 
con currently control most of the capital. And let's travel to Hong Kong now, where four additional people were found guilty of rioting over a major protest that happened back in 2019. Nearly five years ago, hundreds broke into and ransacked the legislator of the financial center. This event was at the height of pro-democracy, anti-government protests in China, and these rioting charges can come up with 10 years in jail. And we end this short tour of the world with a situation that might make you say, oh dear, a meant jack, which is a kind of deer, found himself stuck between a house and a hard place, literally. The man jack was wedged in a tiny gap between two houses, and to make matters worse, it got stuck upside down. Now, the RSPCA and the Lincolnshire Fire and Rescue had to team up to get him out. He was so stuck that they actually had to use ropes and poles to get the job done. Well, unfortunately, he's okay and unharmed, even though probably a little shaken. Back to you guys. Oh, I'm glad he's okay. Thank you so much How for sharing did he that. get himself? I know. Well, to that. And then upside Nicole. down. All right, oh Claudio, goodness. thank you. Thank you. Coming up, Donald Trump takes aim at one of President Biden's biggest bases of support. What we know about his meeting with Teamsters Labor Union and the latest on the push to keep the former president off the ballot in Colorado. That's all next. We are back now with the ongoing Georgia election interference case involving former President Trump. Fulton County District Attorney Fonnie Willis and Special Prosecutor Nathan Wade have been subpoenaed to testify at a hearing on February 15th. Willis is accused of benefiting financially from Wade, her alleged romantic partner. The subpoenas were revealed in a lawsuit filed by the lawyer for Michael Roman, who's one of Trump's co-defendants in this case. He's arguing the charges should be dismissed because of what he calls an improper relationship between the two prosecutors. A judge has given Willis until Friday to respond. On the campaign trail, Trump is seeking the endorsement of one of the country's largest unions, which previously supported President Biden. The former president attended a meeting yesterday with the Teamsters Labor Union, which has 1.3 million members. Biden was endorsed by the group in the 2020 election. As for President Biden, he will be in Michigan today to take part in what the White House is calling a political event. Let's bring in NBC News senior national politics reporter Jonathan Allen. John, good morning. So let's start with former President Trump's meeting in Washington with the Teamsters Union. This is an interesting thing because often when we think of unions, we see them support Democratic mm -hmm. candidates. But we also know that Trump has had this impact of maybe a lot of people who are part of the union, workers in the Midwest who have moved from Democrat to Republican as Trump has been the leader of the party. So how crucial is it for him to get the support of the union? Mm. Does he have a shot of getting the endorsement here? I mean, it's always going to be true in a, uh, um, you know, in a political fight that if a union endorses one candidate or the other, uh, that a lot of the members of that union are going to, <laughs> going to disagree with what the leadership does. I think what's really remarkable here is uh, that the Teamsters endorsed Biden in 2020. Then in 2021, he delivered their number one legislative priority, which was uh, a $90 billion bailout of their pension fund, basically making sure that Teamsters uh, retirees were not going to have to uh, see their benefits slashed in retirement. Um, and now you've got the Teamsters, uh, you know, at least dancing with, flirting with, whatever you want to call it, um, you know, a potential Trump endorsement. I think it's unlikely they end up endorsing Trump, but uh, certainly a slap in the face to Biden from the Teamsters just to meet with Trump uh, after what he'd done for them in the last few years. And I think it's indicative um, of the concern of the union leaders that they're getting out over their skis uh, with the endorsement uh, in 2020 of a Democratic president at a time when many of their members do uh, support Donald Trump. Mm. John, let's talk about these ballot battles, so to speak, that we're seeing pop up in a couple states across the country. Well, Colorado Secretary of State has asked the Supreme Court to conclude that the state can lawfully bar Trump from the GOP primary ballot, citing the 14th Amendment and his alleged role on January 6th. We know the Supreme Court's going to hear those oral arguments next week. What should we know right now about what's going on in Colorado and the Secretary of State's request? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think we're largely waiting um, to see what happens <laughs> with the Supreme Court. I mean, everybody kind of has to wait uh, for the Supreme Court to, to weigh in here, um, you know, and, and everything that happens before then is, um, you know, to, to, <laughs> to misappropriate a legal term uh, moot, right? <laughs> or at some point will be mooted. Yeah. Um, 
you know, look, I, this is an interesting uh, situation. Obviously, there are a couple of states that have uh, have moved in this direction. Um, you know, the American public doesn't appear to support it. Uh, if you look at polling, uh, not only do Republicans object to this, but a fair number of Democrats object to the idea that um, somebody should be removed from the ballot without being convicted of a crime. John, real quickly, for Trump's remaining rival, former U.N. Ambassador Nikki Haley, those controversial comments she made in December about slavery and the Civil War, they came up again. You know, what happened? What's next for her? Yeah, I mean, she's in South Carolina, uh, campaigning in South Carolina, trying to uh, get the votes of moderate Republicans and uh, and Democrats. And it turns out that, um, you know, the Democrats remember what she said about slavery or what she didn't say about slavery when she was asked about the causes of the Civil War. Um, you know, I spoke to a Biden campaign spokesperson uh, just the other day uh, about Nikki Haley's ability to attract Democratic votes. And they said, look, you know, basically, uh, basically Democrats know that slavery uh, was the cause of the Civil War and that the Democrats are going to oppose her on abortion. So, um, you know, she's got a rocky path to try to, to build a coalition to win in South Carolina. All right, John, thanks for joining us as always this morning. Appreciate it. A federal judge in Florida is dismissing Disney's lawsuit against Governor Ron DeSantis. Disney had sued over the loss of its long-standing planning district known as Reedy Creek, claiming that was a violation of its First Amendment's rights. But the judge ruled the suit lacked standing. This all began when former Disney CEO Bob Chapek came out against Florida's so-called Don't Say Gay bill. In response to that, Florida lawmakers began taking steps to dismantle Reedy Creek, which had allowed Disney to make infrastructure changes on its property. In a statement, a Disney spokesperson said the company plans to continue the fight. Coming up, conservative conspiracies can't seem to shake it off when it comes to Taylor Swift. From the election to the Super Bowl, we're diving into everything you need to know that's causing some very real bad blood. Stay with us. Welcome back. Your TikTok feed might be getting a little quieter after the label for some of the biggest artists says it's pulling songs from the app. That includes Taylor Swift. Well, what is not disappearing, though, is the latest right-wing conspiracies about Swift, especially since her relationship with Chiefs tight end Travis Kelsey became public. NBC News entertainment correspondent Chloe Malas has all these details. You know those TikToks with Taylor Swift songs playing? Why you gotta be so mean? Well, they might not be for long in this world. Universal Music Group, one of the big three global music licensing companies, accusing the app of bullying and intimidating them in contract negotiations. On like Amazon Distribution Center, help. That means songs by Drake, Rihanna, Bad Bunny, Billie Eilish, it's me. And yes, Taylor Swift could all be removed from the app. In an open letter, UMG says it has to do with three big things. Safety of TikTok users, the harmful effects of AI, and of course, money. With Universal saying just 1% of its revenue comes from the app. TikTok clapping back, accusing Universal of pushing a false narrative and putting their own greed above the interests of the artists and songwriters. Swift, the biggest pop star in the world, can't seem to get out of the headlines. She's also caught in the middle of right-wing anger and some wild conspiracy theories that have only grown during her relationship with NFL star Kansas City Chiefs tight end Travis Kelsey. Like former Republican presidential candidate Vivek Ramaswamy, implying the Super Bowl is rigged. Former President Trump's lawyer, Alina Haba, reposting a message that asked, who thinks this country needs a lot more women like her and a lot less like Taylor Swift? A tweet firestorm from so-called MAGA influencers. And it's a huge topic on Fox News. Don't get involved in politics. We don't want to see you there. Does Taylor realize the guy that they want her to endorse is a kind of stumbling, bumbling mess? The Pentagon PSYOP unit pitched NATO on turning Taylor Swift into an asset for combating misinformation online. That last one prompting a statement from the Pentagon telling Politico, as for this conspiracy theory, we're going to shake it off. Part of the anger stems from a New York Times article suggesting the Biden White House is toying with a so-called Taylor Swift strategy to win her endorsement and potentially reach her almost 300 million Instagram followers. Swift has not made an endorsement this year, but she did endorse President Biden in 2020 and has backed Democrats in her adopted home state of Tennessee. 
Our thanks to Chloe Malas for that report. Well, our White House team received the following statement from the Biden campaign. Now, although it doesn't specifically name her, it says, quote, unsurprising that the MAGA right is again bullying Americans for having wildly controversial opinions like LGBTQ Americans deserve equal rights. Women should be able to make their own health care decisions and Americans should vote in our elections. Let's get you some financial headlines. Tesla's corporate headquarters could be driving to a new location. CNBC Silvana Hanau has that in other money news for us. Hello, Silvana. Good morning. Hey, Savannah. Hey, Joe. Good morning to you. Yes, so Elon Musk says Tesla shareholders will vote on whether to move the company's corporate headquarters to Texas from Delaware. And that's where hundreds of companies are incorporated because of the state's business and tax-friendly status. Now, Musk's decision coming after a judge in Delaware voided his $56 billion pay package from 2018, calling it excessive and saying it was negotiated by a board that was beholden to him. Musk has a large stake in Texas. Tesla's headquarters and Gigafactory are in Austin, and SpaceX and the Boring Company also have operations there. Hulu is cracking down on password sharing following similar actions by Netflix and Disney Plus. Now, Hulu says unless otherwise permitted by your membership plan, you will not be able to share your account with people outside of your household, which it defines as your primary residence. Now, if Hulu determines you have violated the agreement, it could limit or even terminate your account. Hulu says the new terms took effect last week for new subscribers and will be effective March 14th for existing customers. And MasterCard is jumping into what else? The AI race, launching a new model it says can boost fraud detection by up to 300%. The company telling CNBC the tool will allow banks to better assess suspicious financial transactions on MasterCard's payment network. Data will help the AI understand relationships between merchants and predict where fraud is taking place by using a cardholder's purchase history. MasterCard has invested more than $7 billion in cybersecurity and AI technology. That is AI I can definitely get behind. No kidding. Exactly. Love when we hear some absolutely nice, can help us all uses of AI. Yeah. Thanks, Ivana. <laughs> Coming yeah. up, we're going to introduce you to the photographer behind some of the most iconic images of rock stars ever taken. What he had to say about getting up close and personal with the biggest names in music. That's up next. Welcome back. Well, for you day one Morning News Now viewers, first of all, we love you. Second of all, you know we love a good space story here. And now get this. Scientists say the moon is shrinking, but it's nothing we need to worry about yet. A new study funded by NASA has revealed that over the past few hundred million years, the moon's core has gradually cooled, and that means it's gotten a little smaller but only by about 150 feet in its circumference. While researchers say we won't really know its effect here on us on Earth, it seems to be causing moonquakes that can last for hours, and that could be dangerous for astronauts and future long-term human presence on the moon. I mean, just, you learn something new every day. No kidding. Not moving there then anytime soon. Right. <laughs> Darn. All right. Thanks, Anne. Yeah. Appreciate it. Let's end the hour with a snapshot of an iconic photographer. Danny Clinch's career has brought him up close and personal with some of the biggest names in the music business. Icons like Bruce Springsteen, Johnny Cash, and many, many others. Last week, Clinch celebrated his 60th birthday. He has a lot to reflect on with decades of stories to share. In Asbury Park, New Jersey, the sound of music is set to the beat of a camp. I do my little dance trying to find the, the right composition in the right moment. Whether it's an image of Bob Dylan taken during a photo shoot, one of the Foo Fighters snapped while hiding behind a drum kit. You know, my relationship with them is such that they're like, you know, go wherever you want, just watch out I don't hit you in the head when I swing around my guitar, you know? For decades, Danny Clinch has chronicled music's biggest stars, his photographic Hall of Fame proudly on display at the Transparent Clinch Gallery. We were able to create a space that's welcoming to people, and we are always pushing for good vibes and the idea that, you know, music is medicine. Which is why he has always been drawn to musicians. You know, there's always a mystery around them. Do you think you're trying to capture the mystery? Or are you trying to solve the mystery? Yeah. I mean, I think you're trying to add to the mystery a little bit, you know? 
Flinch got his start interning for an icon, Annie Leibovitz, before making a name for himself in the world of hip-hop with subjects like Tupac and the Beastie Boys. He soon expanded to other genres, amassing an eclectic list of clients, from Johnny Cash to her to Pearl Jam. Some of his favorite photos are now immortalized on t-shirts, the Clinch Collection, which includes one especially meaningful artist. We are in New Jersey, and when people think of New Jersey and music, they think of... Bruce Springsteen. As a Jersey native, Clinch fell in love with the boss's music early on, and eventually got the chance to work with him over and over again. Bruce once said, Danny's got soul. That's a good one. I'll take that anytime. I'm gonna put that on my, my gravestone. Danny's got soul. Bruce Springsteen. <laughs> doing what you do, how important yeah. is it to have soul? You know, you can have great lighting and you can have all the great gear and all that sort of stuff. And if you don't have a connection with someone that shows in the image, you know, I think you failed. In a city known for its music scene, it's no surprise Clinch's gallery hosts the occasional jam session surrounded by his wall of legends. You know, everybody comes in here and we all like, you know, strike the pose. What is it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 One of them, yeah. life size. Yeah. It's hard to look as cool as Bruce, isn't it? It's hard, it's hard. We're trying. How are we doing? How are we looking? Bruce is leaning against Clinch's cough in 1948 Pontiac Silver Streak. He took the picture just a few blocks from the gallery on the Jersey Shore. An iconic Jersey boardwalk, right? Yeah. That's where, on a rather gusty day, Danny showed this non-rock star how he catches those perfect moments. Turns out the answer? I have literally no rhythm. There's not a... Whoa! He's still up! <laughs> he is blowing in the wind. Oh, that's it. I think that's my photo. I think I got it. Here's how that looked through his eyes. One more example of how Danny Clinch is capturing the rhythm of life. Danny Clinch is also involved with something that has become a huge draw for Asbury Park. It's called the See Here Now Festival. C is S-E-A. It happens in September. Marries two Jersey Shore passions, music and surfing. As for those Clinch collection t-shirts, for most of them, a portion of the proceeds go to charities important to the musicians who are captured in those photos. He did Very capture cool. cool photos of me too, but I'm so clumsy that it's impossible. I think that makes you a rock star now. I, <laughs> like that. Just, you know, you've been immortalized by him. It's sort of You and Bruce Springsteen, so cool. Exactly. You need to frame that. I will, I know, okay. I'm gonna get that framed. <laughs> framed. All right, that's gonna do it for this hour of morning news now. But the news continues right now. Good morning. Thanks for joining us this Thursday. I'm Savannah Sellers. I'm Joe Fryer. Right now on Morning News Now, the blame game that's now playing out in the Middle East over the deaths of three U.S. service members in Jordan. The group the Biden administration is now saying is responsible for that deadly weekend attack. Also this morning, the big social media CEOs were in the hot seat on Capitol Hill yesterday, clashing with senators over their app's track records on child safety. You have blood on your hands. You have a product. You have a product that's killing people. We're going to bring you the biggest takeaways from that hearing room in just a moment. Plus, it is a wicked weather phenomenon that is nothing to laugh at. A so-called Pineapple Express system seriously soaking much of the West Coast. Flash flood fears now gripping millions in Southern California, with another few feet of snow expected to fall in the Sierra Mountains. We've got team coverage on what you need to know as you step out the door. And today marks the beginning of Black History Month. Later in the hour, a closer look at the efforts to rebuild a monument of black education here in America that just might be older 
than the nation itself. I look forward to bringing you that story and many more mm -hmm. in the month ahead. Let's begin this hour with the ongoing violence in the Middle East, where the U.S. has again carried out strikes on Houthi targets in Yemen. The Pentagon says it targeted 10 Houthi drones, which it says were threatening Navy and merchant vessels in the Red Sea. The strikes come as the U.S. continues to weigh its response to Sunday's drone attack in Jordan that killed three U.S. soldiers. NBC News Chief International Correspondent Keir Simmons joins us now from Northern Iraq. Hi, Keir, good morning. Hello, guys. Good morning to you. The focus in this region continues to be firmly on Iran and its proxies. And some of those Iranian-backed groups continue to operate despite the threats and overnight fresh strikes from the Biden administration. This morning, as the U.S. readies a multi-target strike against Iranian assets, it says an Iranian-backed group is responsible for the attack that killed three American service members. The U.S. is also renewing attacks against Iran's proxies on other fronts, hitting areas in western Yemen controlled by the Houthis. U.S. F-18s bombing, it says, 10 unmanned drones that were preparing to launch attacks and a ground control station. The Pentagon adding the targets presented an imminent threat to merchant vessels and the U.S. Navy ships in the region. Overnight, the U.S. destroyer USS Kearney also shooting down an anti-ship ballistic missile fired by the Houthis, along with three Iranian drones, according to the Pentagon. The National Guard now confirming at least 41 guardsmen were injured in Sunday's attack against U.S. troops on a remote outpost in Jordan. This, the moment President Biden called the parents of Specialist Kennedy Sanders, one of the three killed. We're promoting her posthumously to sergeant. Oh, wow, Thanks, that is sir. the best news I've heard today. Thank you so much. You don't know how much that means to us. Biden's response, when it comes, likely to target Iranian-backed militias in the region. The U.S. has targeted these groups before, with little discernible impact on their behavior. Now, U.S. officials telling NBC News to expect strikes on multiple places in several countries and locations, including cyber operations. When you're talking about what we're anticipating here, which won't just be a one-off, as I said, the first thing you see will not be the last thing. And the White House rejecting suggestions that the delay is allowing Iran and its proxies to prepare. But a senior Iraqi official, Joan Savannah, tells NBC News that members of Iranian proxy groups here in the region are evacuating headquarters. As the U.S. prepares for those retaliatory strikes, it seems like Iran is readying itself too, guys. All right, Kier, thank you so much. Well, a top Hamas political leader is expected to travel to Cairo in the coming days to review a U.S.-backed hostage proposal. Israel's war cabinet is also considering the possible deal, though it has yet to be put to a vote. It comes as Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu says he will not be releasing prisoners held in his country. He's also refusing to remove troops from Gaza during a potential ceasefire. NBC News foreign correspondent Raf Sanchez joins us now from Tel Aviv with the very latest. Hi, Raf. Good morning. So, look, I mean, the things that Joe and I just stated sound at odds with each other. Let's start there, this ongoing hostage negotiation with Prime Minister Netanyahu refusing to these terms of the New Deal. Where do these talks stand? Where do they go from here? Savannah, good morning. We are playing the waiting game right now. The ball at this point is in Hamas's court. There were Israeli negotiators sitting around the table in Paris over the weekend with the CIA director and officials from Egypt and Qatar. That's the group that agreed to the broad framework of this deal. And we are now waiting to see whether Hamas's political leaders in Cairo this week can sign off on it. The political leadership on its own isn't enough. There's going to be a game of diplomatic telephone where they have to reach Hamas's military leaders who are believed to be underground in the tunnels in southern Gaza right now to get their consent also. But assuming for a second that Hamas, both political and military, does sign off, then all eyes will be on the cabinet of Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu to see whether they will vote for this deal. As you said, the prime minister is saying he is not prepared to release thousands of Palestinian prisoners convicted of terrorism as part of an agreement. He is under real pressure 
from far-right cabinet ministers inside his own government not to make concessions to Hamas. So there's still a lot of hurdles before this deal could go into effect. Yes. Raf, let's talk about something that's made a lot of headlines in the last week. The United Nations is now issuing a new warning saying any decision to halt funds to UNRWA, its main aid agency in Gaza, could have catastrophic effects there. This, of course, follows Israeli intelligence allegations that some of the agency's staff played a direct role in the October 7th attack. What could happen next in this situation? So, Joe, we're hearing from UNRWA this morning. They are saying at this point 16 countries, including the United States, have suspended funding. That suspended funding worth $440 million. And they are saying if that stream does not come back online, they are going to run out of money by the end of February, the end of this month, and they will have to shut their operations down in Gaza. And that has the potential to be absolutely catastrophic. UNRWA, whether you like it or not, is really the only humanitarian organization with the capacity to meet the scale of needs in Gaza right now. They say about 2 million Gazans, the overwhelming majority of the population, are depending on UNRWA facilities in one form or another. We heard from the head of the agency this morning. He said, it is difficult to imagine that Gazans will survive this crisis without UNRWA. Now, the U.S. is saying it is prepared to restore funding pending the outcome of that investigation into allegations that UNRWA staff were involved on October 7th, and they want to see what kind of measures UNRWA is putting in place to make sure nothing like that ever happens again. Guys. Raf, our viewers probably remember that South Africa had brought this case to, UN's, to the U.N.'s top court, and they're saying that Israel is ignoring the ruling that came out of that, that defense forces need to prevent further deaths in Gaza. What else are we hearing from South Africa, and can we expect to see further action here, given that you know, the ruling there wasn't binding, there's nothing really that Israel has to do, but what do you think could come of that? Yeah, Savannah, so that interim ruling from the International Court of Justice came on Friday. Hundreds of Palestinians have been killed since then. The South Africans are saying that is a clear breach of the court's ruling, Israel denying that, saying they do everything they can to minimize civilian casualties. But the South African foreign minister stepping up the rhetoric this morning, saying they want to see Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu arrested and dragged in front of a separate court, the International Criminal Court, also in The Hague, on allegations of war crimes, again, something Israel denies. They're also trying to move the court's judgment to the U.N. Security Council. They want to see it discussed there. The court did order Israel to file a report within one month explaining what steps they were taking to comply with the court's rulings. Guys. All right, Raf Sanchez, thank you very much, as always, for your reporting. Turning now to Congress, where some of the world's biggest social media CEOs were grilled by senators over online safety for kids. Also present in the hearing room and advocating for tougher legislation were parents who've lost loved ones after incidents on social media. NBC News senior national correspondent Kate Snow is here with the details. Hey there, the chief executives of Discord, Snap, TikTok, X, and Meta face tough questions from senators on both sides of the aisle and a frosty reception from the families who were gathered in that hearing room, many wondering why the tech companies in Congress have failed to act while children still face danger on social media sites. In a combative and emotional Senate hearing... You have blood on your hands. You have a product. You have a product that's killing people. The CEOs facing accusations they failed to protect children from illicit content, predators, and extortion. Your platforms really suck at policing themselves. Meta CEO Mark Zuckerberg tangled with senators over his platform's safety record. It appears that you're trying to be the premier sex trafficking no, of course site not, Senator. in this uh, country. Senator, that's ridiculous. Sitting behind the CEOs, grief-stricken families holding photos of children they say were victimized on the company's platforms. Would you like now to apologize? Pressed by Republican Senator Josh Hawley, Zuckerberg turned to address the families. And this is why we invested so much and are going to continue doing these three big efforts to, uh, to make sure that no one has to go through the types of things that your families have had to suffer. Mary Rohde was in the room. She says her son Riley was blackmailed over explicit photos on Facebook Messenger and was so distraught he took his own life. To her, Zuckerberg's words rang hollow. 
When he stood up, he said, I'm sorry for your pain, but, he, but I don't really think he's sorry for my pain. At least six social media bills are still waiting for action in the Senate, including legislation known as the Kids Online Safety Act, which some CEOs declined to support. There are parts of the of the act that we think are great. No, it's, oh, it's a yes or no question. In its present form, do you support it? Yes or no? We, no? we are aware that some groups have raised some concerns. It's important to understand I'll how take that as a no. Some parents remain skeptical. Are you hopeful, thinking things might change after this? I've been in these hearings before. I would love to hear that we're going to pass all these bills and actually protect children, but I'm not convinced that will happen. One of the issues that came up many times, the idea that social media companies have immunity from lawsuits because they are just the platform and not responsible for the content. There are bills that are hoping to change that. One Republican senator on the Judiciary Committee, John Cornyn of Texas, tells me that he thinks there's, quote, quite a bit of enthusiasm among senators in both parties to reform that federal law, although that would take a lot of negotiation. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer tells NBC News he wants to make children's online safety a priority, but nothing is scheduled in in the Senate just yet. Back to you. All right, Kate, thank you. Well, at least three people are dead and nine others injured after a hangar that was under construction at an airport in Idaho collapsed. Now investigators are on the scene trying to determine what caused the incident. NBC News correspondent Aaron McLaughlin joins us now with the details on this. Hey, Aaron, good morning. Hey, good morning. The collapse taking place at a 39,000 square foot airplane hangar that had been under construction where dozens of people were working. In addition, a crane had also fallen, but officials say it's unclear what led to either collapse? We have a structure collapse at the uh, new hangar at Jackson Jet Center. I have one crane collapsed and uh, I guess part, partial structure collapse as well. This morning, authorities are investigating a deadly building collapse in Boise, Idaho that killed three people and injured nine others, five of them in critical condition. It was a, a pretty uh, global collapse that occurred. The main structural members uh, came down. It was fairly catastrophic. The initial call coming in Wednesday evening at a steel jet hangar owned by private aircraft company Jackson Jet Center. The building had been under construction within Boise Airport's airfield. Holy sh Officials describing the scene as chaotic, with several fire engines and at least a dozen ambulances on the ground. Rescue teams making entry, pulling victims out of the wreckage. We did have some that, that were challenging and that there was uh, hoists and so forth. Officials say everyone within the collapse area had been accounted for. The cause remains under investigation. The CEO of the Jackson Jet Center releasing a statement to NBC News, writing in part, our hearts go out to everyone affected by this horrific event. We do not know exactly what caused the hangar collapse. Our focus now is on supporting our team and partners during this difficult time. Boise police will be heading the investigation along with OSHA. NBC News has also reached out to the general contractor for the project, but have not heard back. The victims' names will be released by the Ada County Coroner's Office pending notification of the next of kin. Guys. All right, Aaron, thank you so much. The West Coast is bracing for impact. A storm system known as the Pineapple Express could drop unprecedented amounts of rain, causing flooding, mudslides, and power outages. NBC News correspondent Liz Kreutz has more on that. This morning, wild weather sweeping across the country by the weekend. Though most Americans are feeling above average temperatures right now, intense rain set to move in. Millions are under flood alerts. Rescues already starting overnight as the system known as a Pineapple Express makes landfall in California. It's coming down in waves of like shoo. Dumping snow in the Tahoe area with roads snarled. The rain causing accidents across the state where residents expect flooding. This lifeguard stand right here will be underwater. A dramatic scene in the Bay Area. This massive tree toppling over, trapping a young girl inside. She was rescued with non-life threatening injuries. Officials opening up dams in preparation for excess runoff. This morning, farther south, San Diego bracing for impact again. We lost total loss to everything. Water from last week's 100-year rainfall is still seeping into the soil, increasing the risk of flash floods, rock and mudslides later this week. I want to reiterate, as much as we have been focused on helping residents in these impacted communities recover, we've also been preparing for the rain event. Residents now getting ready with a wet end of the week ahead.
And this storm is now moving south to Los Angeles. The heaviest rain expected around the morning commute. And it's just the beginning. A second, even stronger atmospheric river is expected to hit many of these same areas on Sunday. Back to you. All right, Liz, thank you so much. For more on your forecast, let's get a check at your morning news now weather. Meteorologist Michelle Grossman is here with that. Michelle, good morning. Good morning, guys. And that continues to be the big story. We're going to see that rain still moving into California. Again, the bullseye, as Liz mentioned, into Southern California. We could see one to three inches of rain. That's going to cause some flash flooding, some really heavy mountain snow up to three to four feet in the highest elevations. And we're also looking at some really windy conditions that could cause some power outages. Also watching a few other things really warm in the middle of the country. We're looking at temperatures well above normal, 10, even 30 degrees above normal. Could break some records in the southern plains, temperatures into the mid, if not upper 70s in some spots. Also watching a little bit of snow along the Great Lakes and in portions of northern New England. But this is a big story today. Lots of heavy rain continuing to stream into portions of uh, the West Coast. We're looking at San Francisco getting some heavy rain right now. Fresno down to portions of Southern California, Los Angeles. You're going to have heavy rain as we go throughout the day with those gusty winds as well. So lots of alerts this morning. We have wind alerts for 25 million people, flood alerts, 22 million people, and winter alerts looking at 1 million people under those alerts. So this is what it looks like. We have a one-two punch. So the first punch is coming now as uh, also had it yesterday. So we're looking at that rain heavy, looking at the snow and also wind. And then that second storm right on the heels of this first storm comes in Sunday into Monday, lasting through parts uh, into the uh, latter part of Tuesday as well. And we're looking at the chance for some flash flooding that day. This is a more powerful storm Sunday into Tuesday. So let's go through it. This first storm, we're seeing those scattered showers as we go throughout the afternoon hours. Again, could be heavy at times, could see rainfall rates of three quarters of an inch per hour. This is over really soggy grounds. So that's why we're concerned about flash flooding. We're also looking at that rain snow pushing into the Great Basin, also the Rockies. That will continue tomorrow as that snow moves into the Rockies. Also looking at rain and storms advancing to the Mississippi Valley. We're concerned about severe weather in the Southern Plains as well. Snow and wind continuing in the Rockies. Then this is the second storm. Sunday into Monday, stronger Pacific storm, that stream, that Pineapple Express, as it's called, uh, coming from Hawaii, just bringing all that moisture into the West Coast. So another round of flooding rains and also some really strong winds. As far as the rainfall rates go, the bullseye today will be in Southern California, Los Angeles, Irvine, down to San Diego, where we could see one, two, even three inches of rain. And then we're looking at a whole lot of snow as well. Generally two feet in the mountain peaks, but the highest peaks could see three or four feet of snow. So good news for the skiers there. As we head towards the East Coast, we have a front that's coming through. It's not a big blockbuster front, but still looking at the chance for some cold air slipping in. And that's going to prompt some snow in some spots in portions of the Great Lakes, depending on where you are, you could see a rain snow mix as well. And then we'll see more moderate snow in portions of northern New England. So specifically northern Maine could see some moderate snow as we go throughout the day. That will move out. Again, not talking about a whole lot, generally one to two inches. But as we head towards the northern tip of Maine, we could see higher amounts, five inches in some spots. So that's where you're seeing the pink. And then the purple is looking at four inches of snow. So some higher elevations of Maine could see some heavier rain. Now, as we look towards tomorrow, starting out the weekend, that mountain snow continues in portions of the inner mountain west into the southwest, the Rockies, and we're looking at that rain continuing along the west coast. So, again, uh, concerned about the flooding as we go throughout tomorrow as well. We're watching the chance for strong to severe storms in the southern plains. It's going to be warm, and we're looking at some moisture in there. That's going to prompt those storms, breezy and chilly in portions of New England. And then by Saturday, a really nice weekend in portions of the mid-Atlantic northeast, sunny skies. It will be dry down through the southeast. That mess does continue out west. We're looking at snow continuing throughout the Intermount West, the Rockies, and also some wet weather still lingering along the coast. Now, by Sunday, this is that second storm that's going to come in. So our next western storm, really heavy rain along the coast. You can kind of see underneath the red lettering, the yellows. Uh, that's indicating where we could see some heavier rain. So all throughout California, another round of that. Some blue showing where that snow is throughout the Intermountain West. And then just some rain throughout the northern plains into the uh, central plains, down through portions of the Gulf Coast. We are watching the chance for showers and storms throughout the Gulf Coast and a chill in the air. But here's that February thought. We're looking at temperatures into the upper 70s in some parts wow. in the southern plains. I know it's a big difference. It's like snow and then 70s. <laughs> it's really bizarre. It's I know. been quite it's the winter. It, it has all to say about it. Thanks, Thanks Michelle. Michelle. Sure. <laughs> Jinx. We've got much more to come on this hour of Morning News Now, including actor Alec Baldwin now entering his plea in that deadly onset shooting. We'll bring you the latest. Plus, it was a bombshell day in court for the mother charged in connection with her son's school shooting. Why the man Jennifer Crumbly was having an affair with at the time of the shooting took the witness stand yesterday. Those stories after this.
Welcome back. Actor Alec Baldwin pleaded not guilty on Wednesday to an involuntary manslaughter charge in the fatal shooting of cinematographer Helena Hutchins. He waived an arraignment that was set to happen by video conference today. Baldwin, who served as the lead actor and a co-producer on set of the Western movie Rest, was pointing a gun at Hutchins during a rehearsal when it went off, killing her and wounding the film's director. A grand jury indicted Baldwin in January after prosecutors received a new analysis of the gun that was involved in the shooting. Baldwin faces up to 18 months in prison if convicted. Now to the landmark trial for the mother of Michigan school shooter Ethan Crumbly. And with prosecution set to rest today, the defense could take over, meaning Jennifer Crumbly could take the stand as soon as today. On the seventh day of her trial for manslaughter, jurors heard the details of her arrest and also what she told the man she was having an affair with on the day her son carried out the shooting at Oxford High School. Take a listen. It was um, that something with Ethan. And, her uh, son? Yes. Okay. And uh, was worried um, he was going to do something dumb. Joining us now from Pontiac, Michigan, is NBC News correspondent Maggie Vespa. So, Maggie, let's start with that man that Jennifer Crumbly was having this close relationship with. What else did we learn from him? Right. Yeah, so essentially, guys, this was a uh, huge, you called it a bombshell, like that's accurate point for the defense. Essentially, that soundbite that you just heard was the main kind of point they honed in on, excuse me, for the prosecution that they honed in on uh, yesterday. That was Brian Malo. She's a firefighter and a high school classmate of Jennifer Crumley's, and he testified that the two indeed were having an affair, and as part of that affair, they texted and messaged, he said, a lot. And on the day of the shooting, he said that Jennifer Crumley, he testified, that she messaged him before she even went to that meeting at the high school before she went to talk to administrators about kind of the latest warning signs surrounding her son. And he said she messaged him that she was worried her son was going to do something dumb. And remember, that is so big for the prosecution because their entire theory this time, the entire uh, sort of rationale behind these involuntary manslaughter charges is that they say Jennifer Crumley had clear warning signs that her son was struggling, that he could potentially be violent. And guys, they say she ignored them. So again, those messages and just kind of that full disclosure that full picture painted of what their life was like at the time mm. seemed really big for prosecutors in this case. Absolutely. Maggie, jurors also heard a lot about Jennifer Crumbly's arrest, what actually happened. This was also part of yesterday's uh, what happened in the courtroom, including witness details leading up to her arrest and then brand new body camera footage as well. What did that all tell us? Yeah, you know, this was kind of a storyline that a lot of people might have forgotten about. It was in the days after the shooting, basically when charges were announced against the parents less than a week after the shooting in 2021, the parents went on the run and there was a statewide manhunt for James and Jennifer Crumley uh, cut to December 3rd. A man who owns a business around here in the Detroit area uh, said that he pulled up to his business at night. There should have been no one there. Logically, there was a car there he didn't recognize, two people in it. He got suspicious and he checked the license plate against news reports realized, oh my God, this is the car the police are looking for tied to the Crumleys. He calls 911. Cut to a couple hours later, Detroit police body camera video played in court yesterday of officers in tactical gear storming a warehouse in Detroit, arresting both parents, yelling at them to put their hands up, cuffing them inside that warehouse. It's a really uh, dramatic video and just kind of reiterates how the Crumleys knew when they knew that there were charges, potential criminal charges being lobbed against them, uh, charged. They went on the run to try to kind of evade authorities, and it didn't last long, guys, but a huge moment again for the prosecution. So, Maggie, as we've mentioned, Jennifer could take the stand as soon as today in her own defense. What could we expect if she's asked to testify? Sure. And there's no set schedule. We expect the prosecution to wrap today. They expected, they said, to wrap yesterday, but they say they may have at least one more witness. Essentially, then the defense will take over if and when they wrap. And Jennifer's attorney said in her opening statement that Jennifer intends to testify in her own defense. She gave no details as to what they expect her to say. But we've heard from parents here of kids who were injured and an attorney for kids or for families of the victims in this shooting. They say all they want from Jennifer Crumley is the truth. They feel like they keep hearing half truth 
truths about what she knew, what she didn't know, what she should have done, what she just uh, suspected in her son if they talked about, you know, how much he was struggling. So that's what they want from her. We are anticipating her uh, testimony again to begin as soon as today. Beyond that, what the defense has planned, we'll have to see. But it is feasible, guys, given the pace of kind of these last few witnesses, that that could happen today. Potentially, this trial could get handed over to the jury as soon as this week, as this has been moving on at a decent clip. And then we'll obviously wait and see the decision. And again, this unprecedented case here in Michigan. All right. Maggie, thank you so much. Let's bring in NBC News legal analyst Angela Senadella for where we go from here. Okay, first, Angela, I think a lot of people yesterday were surprised by this bombshell news of this affair, as well as, of course, what that man had said. But it's not surprising people were surprised because the judge had initially barred prosecutors from disclosing that Jennifer Crumbly was having an affair. But then her opposition to that was later dropped about it being brought up. Why in the first place would they be barred from discussing that? And then what factors were being weighed in the decision to eventually drop that? Right. So the barring happened because the judge felt it was not relevant and it was prejudicial to Jennifer Crumbly. Now, the fact that her opposition dropped that or that her side dropped that means that she felt or her lawyers felt it could be helpful to their defense in some way, mm. either because they felt it was going to come out anyway. It was obvious. Look, he was already on the stand when that relevation was made and when her opposition was dropped. So perhaps Perhaps they thought it enhances her credibility. It could also be related to her taking the stand. Perhaps she's going to say she did rely on him for emotional support. And lastly, I think there were some messages here that her defense team could use to their advantage. The prosecution is painting her to be this absent mother who didn't care at all about him. But from these messages, also, some of them include that she was concerned about her son. Mm -hmm. She also did blame the school. And I believe that's going to be the crux of the defense that they that it was the school who had primary responsibility. Let's talk more about the prosecution. They're essentially trying to prove that her negligence contributed to these deaths. How are they making that argument and how well have they presented their case so far? They've made a pretty strong case so far, and it all comes down to these mental health concerns, plus the fact that they bought him a gun. So those seem to be the two factors that they are putting together. But that said, when the school official was put on the stand and questioned by the defense about how come they did not search his backpack, the school official said, well, it's because he wasn't a real threat. So I think we're going to see the defense continue to pull that through. On one hand, the school is saying, quite obviously, they told her that he was in danger, that he was a threat. On the other hand, they didn't search. So that's what the defense is going to go with. So Jennifer and her husband, James, they are the first parents of a mass shooter to be charged in a school shooting like this. They're being tried separately, though. Is all these types of things that we're seeing here, the evidence going to play into his trial? Yes, I think without a doubt. Obviously, subject to the judge in that trial deciding what is relevant, what is admissible, and what is not. But all of this testimony under oath seems precisely relevant. Now, with regards to the affair, though, we're not sure how that'll come into play because that might really be irrelevant to his trial. Mm. Angela Sanadella, thank you, as always, for being here. Breaking this morning, the European Union reached a new deal on funding for Ukraine. NBC News foreign correspondent Claudia Lavanga has that in other world headlines. Claudia, good morning. Savannah Joe, good morning. Well, that's right. The president of the European Council, Charles Michel, announced on his social media platforms that the leaders of the European Union have reached an agreement to create a 50 billion euro, euro fund for Ukraine. Now, the main obstacle for that deal so far has been the veto by the Prime Minister of Hungary, Viktor Orban. He had been demanding an annual opportunity to veto the issuing of money to Ukraine. Instead, according to EU officials, European Union leaders agreed to a regular review of the way the money is being spent to ease concerns about corruption. Let's now go to the Maldives, where a video shows chaotic scenes in the parliament with lawmakers trading kicks near the speaker's chair. During the fight, others are heard shouting from the floor amid the sounds of toy trumpets. According to local media, the fight broke out after the main opposition Maldivian Democratic Party decided to withhold parliamentary approval for some members of the president's cabinet ahead of a key vote. At least one member of parliament was injured during the violent altercation. And let's end this tour of the world in Scotland, where a monkey has been on the run since Sunday after he escaped from his enclosure. But park officials have even 
even been using thermal drones to help them search for the animal in the wilderness of the Scottish islands and have asked residents to report sightings. But residents seem to be pretty amused about this and are rooting for the animal. The monkey escaped from the Highland Wildlife Park in the small town of King Goosey. So it came to nobody's surprise when the residents renamed or nicknamed the monkey King Goosey Kong. Of course. Back to you guys. Claudio, just bringing it this morning with the animal stories. Perfect nickname. All right. <laughs> They're rooting for him. Yeah. Thanks, Claudio. <laughs> Coming up, in the midst of America's ongoing opioid crisis, there are growing concerns this morning over a dangerous product you can find right here on Main Street. It's sometimes called gas station heroin. It's not only addictive, but pretty readily available across the country. So why is it legal? We're going to take a closer look next. We are back now with a warning from some Alabama doctors about a dangerous trend now being seen in other parts of the country. It's an over-the-counter product known as gas station heroin. Doctors say it contains an ingredient called tianeptine, which is highly addictive and readily available. As NBC's Valerie Castro reports, the FDA is now being urged to take action. It's a drive Chrissy Reifschneider used to do on a regular basis near her home in Huntsville, Alabama. See these little gas stations right here? Like the mom and pops. These were these are the places they would sell them. Buying over-the-counter products dubbed gas station heroin, sometimes labeled as a dietary supplement and containing the synthetic drug tianeptine. This is where I would come every day and come by two to three bottles a day. At the height of her addiction, spending around $150 a day on the brand Tiana Reds that she says would give her energy, constantly using the pills to avoid withdrawals. It's a dangerous drug just because it's legal and over the counters. I compare it to fentanyl and heroin. So when they say gas station heroin, that's an accurate description? It's an accurate description so far that they're hitting similar receptors. It really acts a lot like an opioid. Dr. William Rushton, a medical toxicologist and director of Alabama's Poison Information Center, says he and his colleagues began to sound the alarm in 2019 as calls from emergency room doctors began to pour in. Patients were being admitted to ICUs with concerning symptoms, some in the throes of a dangerous withdrawal. It's not just when you take it but it's when you stop taking it, um, becoming sort of very ill, very agitated, potentially having seizures. The drug is legal in parts of Europe, prescribed as an antidepressant, but it's not approved in the U.S. for medical use. Alabama passed legislation in 2021 banning tianeptine, followed by several neighboring southern states. But despite the crackdown, the problem is growing. We absolutely know now it's spreading throughout the rest of the country, and we're seeing it in the northeast United States. Nationwide, America's poison centers have seen a steady increase in calls. The Food and Drug Administration issuing warnings as recently as this year, focusing on the brand Neptune's Fix Elixir, linking it to adverse event reports of seizures, loss of consciousness, and death calling on retailers to stop selling the product and announcing that the maker has agreed to a voluntary recall. The company stating in a recall announcement, distribution channels have not reported any adverse events from the use of its products. NBC News reached out to the makers of Tiana Reds, Pegasus, Zaza and Neptune's Fix for comment, but did not hear back. The FDA doesn't have the authority to approve dietary supplements for safety, but is now under pressure from a handful of bipartisan lawmakers, sending a letter to the agency in January stating the urgent need for FDA action on tianeptine cannot be overstated. We need to empower the FDA to have sort of more regulation over a lot of these supplements out there so that we don't have to play defensive. We know we can uh, play more offensive. Reif Schneider has now taken to social media warning others. These things are the devil's candy. Saying her withdrawal even led to thoughts of suicide. Something switched in my brain like this is how you need to end your life, this is it. Sharing these pictures of herself during what she says were her darkest times. Describe the person that you see when you look back at those photos. Death, I don't even know who she is, it's scary. Now almost four years sober and newly married, she's focused not only on her recovery, but sharing her story to help others. I honestly never thought I would even be here. Um, Everybody has a story, and I know you might not think something, you know, could help someone, but one little thing can change someone's life. 
Our thanks to Valerie Castro for that report. Well, Tianeptine is not approved by the FDA for any medical use, and it has not been reviewed for safety, effectiveness, or quality. That letter from lawmakers asked the FDA if any steps have been taken to regulate this drug under the Controlled Substances Act, similar to cocaine or marijuana. A spokesperson said they will respond to those questions directly to lawmakers. In a first-of-its-kind study, researchers at Stanford and Harvard University say some students are bouncing back after falling behind during the pandemic. But they also say there is still work to be done, especially when it comes to low-income school districts. NBC News correspondent Blaine Alexander has the details. It was a troubling trademark of the pandemic. Students learning through computer screens with growing concern over just how much they would be set back. In the first of its kind study, experts are now examining just how quickly students are recovering, looking at test scores across 30 states for third through eighth graders, comparing scores from 2019 to 2022 with those from 2023. They found while many students have made gains, they are still far behind pre-pandemic scores. In math, which took the hardest hit, students have made up about a third of that regression. And in reading, 25%. It suggests we're, we're on our way to a full recovery. We're certainly not there yet, but I think we've made up a lot more ground in one year than many people would have predicted, certainly more than we've ever made historically in one year. But the numbers also show the education gap between wealthy and low-income districts only widened with the pandemic. My worry is that the educational legacy of the pandemic will be a, a kind of persistent widened inequality. Making matters worse, experts say, a $122 billion federal relief package to help fund programs like tutoring and summer school is set to end in September. How critical is that money when it comes to your recovery? It, it, it was paramount. Dr. Mark Sullivan is superintendent of Birmingham City Schools, where math test scores have almost completely returned to pre-pandemic levels. He credits more school hours and staff support with making the difference. But when that money goes away... We really have to be strategic in only keeping those programs that we can afford that really move the needle on student achievement. Schools making significant strides with a long way to go. Blaine Alexander, NBC News. NBC Savannah Hanau has those numbers for us and some other money headlines. Hey, Savannah, good morning. Hey, Savannah. Hey, Joe. Yes, yeah, so we are just getting some fresh data on the health of the economy and labor market. Jobless claims up 9,000 to 224,000 last week. Economists were expecting 214,000. Now, tomorrow, though, we get the monthly jobs report before the opening bell, so we'll be keeping a close eye on that. All right, Universal Music Group has started to remove the song catalog of artists it represents, including Taylor Swift and Olivia Rodrigo. This from TikTok after talks to renew a licensing agreement broke down this week. Now, Universal has accused TikTok of trying to bully it into a bad deal, while TikTok says the label is putting its own interest above those of its artists. Now, all Universal-owned music featured in TikTok videos will be muted, and users will have to replace the remove tracks with alternative options. Starbucks is adding a romance to the menu for Valentine's Day. The chain unveiling two new drinks that you can buy in stores and through the Starbucks app. The chocolate-covered strawberry cream frappuccino, sounds delicious, and a chocolate hazelnut cookie cold brew. There's also a new collection of Valentine's themed drinkware, including cold cups, mugs, and tumblers with hearts and floral designs. All this for a limited time, guys. How many calories is a chocolate? <laughs> but it sounds delicious. Chocolate? It does sound yeah, good, it, but it's like I don't know. Like, I, I mean, sounds like I could only coffee. have a sip. All these I like only milkshake have a sip of things, yeah. Yeah. All right. it's Just a for a sip. You might exactly. like it. You love sweet stuff. I, I like sweet stuff, but I do like basic yeah. cold brew coffee. Yeah. So there you go. All right. Yeah. Thanks. Coming up, a historic restoration effort is underway this morning as Black History Month begins. After the break, the mission of one centuries-old Virginia schoolhouse that brought critical knowledge to those who needed it most. We're going to explain next. Black History Month begins today, and rock star Lenny Kravitz is reflecting on his barrier-breaking career in People magazine. Kravitz says he was told that if he wanted to succeed, he needed to make music similar to other black artists on the radio, but he refused and instead pulled from all kinds of genres to make his first album. Clearly, that worked out well for him. The rock star is set to receive the People's Music Icon Award at this year's People's Choice Awards, along with the Recording Academy's Global Impact Award 
by the Black Music Collective. All well deserved. Absolutely, and very cool awards. Joe, thank you so much. Yeah. Well, this morning we're getting an exclusive look at a schoolhouse that's believed to be the oldest structure in North America dedicated to the education of black children. Today's show anchor Craig Melvin takes us inside the efforts to restore the building and preserve its historic legacy. It's not strange to see old looking buildings around Colonial Williamsburg, but this one now covered in scaffolding was hiding in plain sight for decades before researchers established it had once been the Williamsburg Bray School. 1830s. Janice Kennedy has lived here all her life. She passed the building countless times not knowing its past, and for her, history is empowering. I needed to know so I could teach my children who they were, so they would feel like when they walk into a space that they had every right to be there. They needed everybody to approve of them. The Bray School operated from 1760 to 1774. Its mission? to educate black children, most of them enslaved. Dr. Maureen Elgersman Lee is the director of the Bray School Lab at William & Mary. The Bray Associates were based in London. They were rooted in the Anglican faith, and they had a real mission to educate children that they considered heathens. The enslavers actually thought they were saving their souls. Students ages 3 to 10 were taught to read the Bible and other books. The lessons geared toward teaching religion and obedience, but no one could control what they did with that knowledge. We do know that at least one child who went to the Bray School, Isaac B., ran away on two different occasions. The school closed when its teacher died, and in part because of the American Revolution, it never reopened. The building stayed on the campus of William and Mary, used for housing and other purposes, until it was moved in 1930 to make way for a new dormitory. After it was certified as a former home of the Bray School, Colonial Williamsburg bought the building and moved it to a new location last year. Matt Webster is the chief architect. They actually built the trailer underneath of the building, and then we pulled it out, we brought it here. We had a foundation already built, and then we slid the building across on big I-beams to where the, the, the spot that you see it now. Webster's team is now working to restore the building before it's open to the public this fall. So Matt, this, this is wood from the 1700s? It is. This wood is from 1760. Um, we know that because we actually did a study called dendrochronology, so it's looking at growth patterns in trees, tree ring dating. We know that the trees felled to build this building were felled in the winter of 1759, 1760, spring of 1760, and the school opened September 29th, 1760. See her family's history with her own eyes. One of her ancestors was a free black child who attended the Bray School. Elijah Jones there. She was overcome with emotions when she first went into the building after learning its true history. I can't describe how surreal that was. You get to look out the window and walk where they possibly walked. Wonder how many of those children that were in those buildings from different times were actually a part of me, not just the one that we know about, but how many more. When you walk through it, what'd you feel? A lot of emotion, joy, uh, sorrow. I wish my mother was here to know about it. I wish my grandfather was here to know about it. She thinks about her family, who've been in this area since they were brought here, and just how far they've come. They planted those seeds. They cast our seeds to the wind. The wind picked them up and took them everywhere. We are everywhere. We've impacted this nation. So that shows how powerful we are how we thrive, and that's why the story is so important. Our thanks to Craig Melvin for that report. The Bray School is set to open to the public in September. While Colonial Williamsburg works on the physical structure, scholars at the Bray School Lab are working to gather oral histories and make contact with descendants of students from the school. What an incredible undertaking. Fantastic project. Also fascinated how they could determine when that would was. <laughs> it's like just a little tidbit in there that was really interesting yeah, as well. Totally. The whole project is just so impressive that yeah. people are able to successfully do such a thing. And right. as you said earlier, we'll be bringing lots more stories like this throughout Black History Month. Absolutely. All right, that's going to do it for this hour of Morning News Now. Stay with us, though, because the news continues right now.
Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.